No one knows, even now, how many died in the Badajoz massacre. The nationalists allowed them no memorial. They took the prisoners from the bullring to the cemetery and disposed of the bodies. I could see a cloud of smoke hanging over the cemetery, over this corner of the cemetery. And the following day I came straight to the cemetery to find out what was happening. And it was then that I had the most Dante-esque vision of my life as a journalist. There were bodies of people who had been shot piling up in one of the wings of the cemetery. They had been set on fire with petrol to be destroyed. I recall as if it were today, the day I came here and left utterly distressed. And I was so distressed that a priest looked at me and realizing I was so hurt and so sad, asked me what was wrong with me. I sighed and he shrugged. They deserved it, they deserved it, he said. This was my last sight of Badajoz in those first days after the town had been taken over. And I swore I would never come back here. But here I am to give my testimony, since I feel that I can no longer hide the sad memories I have of that time. The terror did not end with the battle. A month later, prisoners were still being executed in the bullring. To be a Republican in Badajoz was to ask for death. Such a one was the husband of Teresa Villalobos. He was the town photographer. I don't mind saying it, he was a Republican. When the Republic was declared, he was the first to put out the flag. He said, let's go back to Badajoz. He said, I don't think they'll detain me, even though I'm left wing. I certainly don't think they'll kill me or anything. So we came back and they caught him. Well, of course, they jailed him and I went to look for him. I said, what's up? He didn't do anything. He wasn't with the fighters or anything. That was wasted effort and they took him to the bullring. My father-in-law and I went to the bullring to see him. I went in and there was a window, but I couldn't go near him or he near me. But he stretched out his hand and I kissed it and he kissed mine. But I couldn't go near him to kiss his face. His face was like yellow wax. He had big blue eyes. His eyes were glued on me and his father and it was pitiful to see him. He said, Father, these are the worst moments of my life. Do what you can because they'll kill me. We went away because the guards said we couldn't talk anymore and had to wait till the morning. Then we went to the cemetery. It took several days for the terrible truth of the Badajoz massacre to reach the rest of Spain. In Madrid, the news coincided with the first air raids on the capital. Together they provoked a new wave of spontaneous vengeance against anyone suspected of nationalist sympathy. Prime targets were right-wing political prisoners in the city's Modelo jail. A fire broke out in the prison, either started by political prisoners trying to escape, or by common criminals egged on by the anarchist militias who had taken charge of one wing of the jail. However that may be, the consequence was tragic. A crowd gathered and herded the prisoners out of their cells. Socialists protested, but shootings began. They picked people out, took them outside and we could hear shots. It was like a scene from the French Revolution. There was a table with some candles tucked in bottles and they had a tribunal of men and women there dressed in overalls and wearing strange hats. Raimundo Fernández Cuesta was a member of the fascist party. Another prisoner was Ramón Serrano Suña, General Franco's brother-in-law. Another was Don Melquiades Alvarez, a former speaker 
of the Spanish Parliament. They grabbed him and he turned round to us and said, to spend all my life defending the people, to end up in this way, to finish like this. And he said goodbye. A very short while afterwards, we heard shots from one of the cellars under the gallery itself. That's where they killed him and the others. In our trade, the atrocity, some European ambassadors threatened to recognize the army rebel government. Socialist leader Prieto said that night could lose them the war. Prime Minister Hiral wept. President Othania wished himself dead. The revolution had swept away formal courts, but the Modelo tragedy made some system of justice imperative. New courts were set up. The rebels were allowed lawyers in what were called popular tribunals, and they began to curb the worst excesses of revolutionary justice. The absence of clear authority had also meant setbacks for the Republic at the front. Franco's army took Talavera, a step nearer Madrid. In the north, General Moller cut that branch of the Republic off from any chance of supply from France by capturing Irún. On the Aragon front, the Republican columns failed to take Taragotha. The revolution was underway in the rear guard, but at the front, the Republican militias were getting beaten. Enrique Lista, a commander of the 5th Regiment, was trained in Moscow. No eran eh, efectivas porque las milicias eh, no obedecían realmente. The militias were not effective because they didn't really obey the general staff. They took their lead from unions, from political parties. They were not effective militarily from the point of view of fighting a regular organized army, such as we were facing at the front. The other side had brought forces from Africa. They had some of the best military units at their disposal and regular units of foreign armies were starting to arrive. Later, of course, there were Italian troops and the German Condor Legion. We couldn't face up to them at the front with party or union militias which didn't obey orders, who, whenever they received an order, had to hold a general assembly to decide whether or not they would obey it. As the Republic's war effort flagged and failed, the Prime Minister Hiral resigned. Lago Caballero, the socialist trade union leader, replaced him with a government which included communists for the first time. As Prime Minister and War Minister, Lago tried to bring the fragmentary and fragmented revolution under control and to centralize the war effort. In one instance, at least, it was too late. At Toledo, the Republican militias had besieged the local army rebels who had occupied the old Arab fort, the Alcatha. The siege was a shambles. There was absolutely no discipline whatsoever in, in their attack. People would come out on Sundays, for example, and they were allowed ordinary people from Madrid out for the weekend, would drive in lorries or cars if they had them, and they took a pot shop at the Alcazar. They were very proud of being able to go back to Madrid and say they had done so. Prime Minister Lago Caballero was getting desperate. He tried to end the siege by having miners dynamite the rock on which the Alcatar stood. It didn't work. Within 10 days, the garrison was relieved by Franco's efficient troops, and the Republicans retreated. Franco made a meal of the Alcatha. It had delayed his attack on Madrid. But Toledo made him a hero. Within days, he became Generalissimo, commander-in-chief, and then head of state in the Nationalist Zone. 